All right, here we go, here we go. Knicks fans of the round table. The round table debate show for the fans, by the fans. Today's episode, the quarter season report. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And joining me today first, my guy Terrence Ross, the real Terrence Ross from the Terry and Trey show. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, what's going on? That's always what's that's up? always my line for you, man. The I real know, Terrence I know, Ross. I man. know. When Terrence Ross was killing us a couple of games ago, my friends wouldn't give me the end of it. But yeah, up, man. Guys? Make no mistake, man. <laughs> uh, also joining us, my guy from the Knicks Film School, Jonathan Macri, Jay Macri. What's going on, man? How are you feeling today, man? I'm doing good, man. I, I, we were saying before, I cleaned my house this morning. I'm, I'm getting ready to go out and get that tree later today. <laughs> We're settling all family business before the Nick game. Tonight. Absolutely, man. Production, production, man. Production. And last last but not least, Alex Wolf from Posting and Toasting, my Sunday night co-host for Nick's Post Game Live. Yo. Al, how you feeling today, man? I'm good. How about you, man? Hey, I'm, I'm feeling good, man. Feeling good. Although okay. it was a, a wild week for, for, for the Knicks fan base, for the Knicks team. Yeah. Uh, a lot of mudslinging, a lot of rumors. Um, so I feel like, you know, I feel like this episode is is a perfect um, episode to make so we can kind of unhash it all. We're 23 games into the season, just about the quarter mark. And, you know, unsurprisingly to, to, to many, you know, with the Knicks, we, we've had a season's worth of action so far. You know, whether it's, you know, we've had some quality wins, we've had some expected terrible losses. We've had outstanding play from some unheralded rookies and not so outstanding play from, you know, some of our highly touted prospects. Uh, the, the free agency rumors, the trade rumors, you know, the, it seems like the, the Fisdale honeymoon might be souring for some. Um, a lot to unpack, man. So, like I said, today we just want to go through what we see so far, not indicative of, of any, uh, you know, future performance, but so far right now, the good, the bad, the ugly. So let's start with the good. You know, let's start with the good news. Um, Terry, I'll start with you, man. What what have you seen so far this year um, that, you know, you want to applaud this team for? So one thing I could say from a kind of bird's eye perspective is that guys are riding for Fizz, and that bodes well for not just the immediate, but more the long-term future. The mm-hmm. fact that Fizzdale can, in, and we, we know this about his personality, we knew he'd be that, you know, that cool uncle, father figure type coach that would get guys to play for him, but... It's not just the effort they're putting in, they're executing in certain ways. Yeah. And Fizz has had an effect on the team. And I want, I'm watching him with these reclamation projects who kind of on their last leg, trying, you know, trying to make it. And I'm wondering, wow, when he gets KP, when he gets more talent, what is he going to be able to come up with? Now, there's some questions about the offensive system, of course, but I think... A lot of questions on the system, man. Well, a I'm, lot of questions. Yeah. And I'm sure we're going to get into that in the bad and ugly <laughs> section of this. But... On this a base level, in a tanking season, I think, Mac, you brought it up on Twitter, I think, what, 15 out of 20 games so far, we've been competitive. And something like that, yeah. Something like that. And we, look at our roster. We have one of the worst rosters in the league, hands down, without KP. So the fact that, you know, we're going to these games, we're playing hard, uh, even if it isn't always pretty, these guys are riding for Fizz. Um, it feels good to have a coach that is respected in the NBA, that players may want to come play for, and that players will play hard for, especially after the last couple coaches. So... That's definitely something, taking a bird's eye view, I feel good about going forward for the franchise. Mac, Macri, um, T- Terry made the point about, you know, some of the people in the fan base um, co- complaining about the lack of play calling, and, and you had quite a bit to say about that this week. Um, what What's your take on, you know, what we've seen so far in terms of, you know, the offensive sets or, um, you know, the lack thereof that, that people have been uh, complaining about? So, you know, and I'll start actually by stealing a point made by Alan Hahn on the on the Knicks fix, uh, the, the Facebook page. I think he made this point about three or four weeks ago when people were already starting to complain about the offensive sets. You have you have the youngest team in the league and you have a priority, uh, almost a mandate, if you want to get guys on the floor in, you know, Mitchell Robinson and and Kevin Knox, who, to be quite honest with you, have no business playing in the NBA right now. Um, They don't. I mean, the the talent is there. The physical ability is there. But in terms of them being able to, like, execute at an NBA level, that shouldn't be the case right now. I'm sorry. It just just shouldn't. So Fisdale, to me, is instituting a system that doesn't look pretty at times because it's ultra simple. It doesn't, it's like, okay, just if you could execute these couple of things, 
you're going to be able to at least get on the floor. So to me, the fact that he he's doing something to make sure that these kids get playing time and, and are developing, you know, on an NBA on an NBA court, that to me is the most important thing. And then, you know, just to, to go back to, to Terry's point, he made a second ago, um, like <laughs> they've been competitive on my count now, 23 games in, I'm pretty sure they've been competitive into the fourth quarter in either 17 or 18 of these games. They have, I would argue, the worst best player in the league in, I mean, I guess you'd say Tim Hardaway Jr. Um, and like their overall offensive, ta- overall talent period, forget offensive talent, their overall talent is just so low. Um, they're 25th in net rating in the league. That's, I mean, obviously it's not great, but like <laughs> it's better than I expected. I'll tell you that much. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm at. Al, what about you? What, what's your take on um, the, the offense and, and even the defense at, at, at times just so far this year? I think the the main takeaway with the offense is that it, it's like it's like they've said already, you know, it's such a young team uh, that it's it's tough to really judge it. Like if you just looked at it from the scope of what you normally expect with like a new regime for a team, they have not only a new coach, which is normally enough of an adjustment by itself, but the roster turnover was insane. Yeah. So and they're all, you know, 26 or basically. Um, so to expect too much more out of them would be kind of foolish. Um, that said, though, I mean, it, there is definitely a little bit to worry about with the lack of creativity on Fizz's end. Um, you know, it, he's been kind of hit for uh, not having good after timeout plays, which is definitely true. Um, and he himself has acknowledged that, though, so it's something that he's working on, which is good to see. It, I like that he's he's humble and he, he seems willing to admit his own faults, which is uh, nice to see after a guy like uh, – like a uh, horn shack who was just kind of always uh, 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 not willing to admit when he was in the wrong. Um, so it's nice to see a coach just kind of humble like that. Um, but as far as, as far as the offense goes though, I mean, I think that especially also with the, the volatility of the starting lineup and the bench units right now, it's tough to get these guys really like familiar with each other. Um, and to a point where they're comfortable running plays together. So I think that plays a part as well. I mean, it, it, honestly, I'm waiting till after game 25, and then maybe if we get five, ten games past that, say we get towards like the 35th game, something like that, and we're getting towards the, the true middle point of the season, then I think it's more fair to start judging him. Like my, my cutoffs personally are like after 25 games, if for the five games after that, things are still a mess, I'm going to be like, well, that's a broken promise because you said that you were going to settle things by 25 and I want to see a little bit of stability. Um, you know, tweaks are fine, but the, he, he completely overhauls the starting lineup like every few games, you know, and it, and it get, that you can't do if you want to start, you know, building these guys into roles and stuff. Um, and then, you know, like I said, it may be 10 games beyond that um start really setting offense because then you've got an established starting unit hopefully an established bench unit and certain guys just fully out of the rotation that need to be out of the rotation so yep that's my thought i don't know that was a little long-winded i went a little longer than i thought i was going to yeah but. all good man all good man Pat, passionate knicks fan passionate knicks fan um <laughs> macri let's go back to you what what has been your good so far on uh, in, in this uh quarter season mark my good, uh, I'll try to keep this one short. Noah Vonley. I mean, he is the so he has a the only Nick with a positive net rating, which means every like if you take all the minutes that he's been on the floor this year, the Knicks have outscored their opponents during those minutes. And considering that their record is whatever it is, seven and and uh, 14, 16. yeah, yeah, 15, um, like that's amazing. That, that in over – it's 566 minutes he's played. And they're, they are outscoring their opponents during that time. And, you know, I, I think just to connect it to a larger point, the fact that he's one of these scrap heap guys, the fact that they got him on a non-guaranteed deal, and the fact that this is a guy who, you know, he's like, there are different places I could go to try to rehabilitate my career. I choose New York. Um I think that's meaningful. And I, I think that it, it can't go, you know, even putting aside the concerns about, is he going to be back next year, this or that? I just, I'm a, I'm a big fan of him and I'm bigger, a big fan of, of what he represents uh, and what he's doing. So yeah, no online for me. 
Yeah, yeah, no, Noah, Noah's yeah. definitely been playing well, man. I mean, I remember when we got him, and and you know we had that live stream, and fans were calling in. I mean, so many fans were just like, "Oh, this guy's terrible," you know, he he's uh, he's a bum, he's washed, he's a journeyman, and he, he now now we got guys talking about he's the next Anthony Mason. I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> take take <laughs> it up. easy there, take it easy <laughs> there, man. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Terry. Been incredible. He's been incredible. Yeah. Um, I always thought the best person to go next to Kristaps would be a kind of 4-5 hybrid guy like Julius Randle. Yeah. And Von Lay's bargain mm-hmm. Randle. I'm so excited. <laughs> to see him. I'm so excited to see him and KP play together eventually because you could see a 4-5 switch offense defense. Von Lay can bang down low, but he can stretch the floor. He's hitting 40% of his threes. I think Crazy. he's the second best three-point shooter on the team right now after um, Iso mm-hmm. Zoe. So Von Le has been such a surprise. I think he was the last, you know, he was the kind of, like you said, the scrap heap. He was pretty much the last of these one-year guys to come on. No one gave him a lot of thought. There was a lot of thought into Moody, a lot of thought into Hizonia, a lot of thought into even Trey Burke this year. And Von Le came on in the end. He had to cut the other Noah <laughs> to get him, to yeah. make sure he can sign. And he just taken that opportunity and run with it. Uh, Fizdale called him his best two-way player. And that's not a lie. Uh, Von Le has been... No complaints at all. I'm just excited to see his continued growth because he looks like a real player in this league. True indeed. Yeah. True, true indeed. Yeah, I, go ahead. I concur with all that, man. Like I, and you know, I think we talked about this on Sunday's live streams. Well, about Von Le or, or one of them. I, f- I forget which show, but he's he's a guy that this didn't totally come out of the blue. You know, it's it it was you could see signs of it last year in Chicago. He averaged something like six point six boards. Um, I don't yeah, think he, he started coming on well in that second half. Yeah, and, and and you know you didn't see necessarily this level of production out of him. I mean, he's been he looks like a starter right now. You know, he looks like an NBA starter. Not not your best player, not anything like that, but a guy that does all the dirty work. You know, he he plays good D. He rebounds. He, he's sort of I've I've likened him to this before, but he's sort of like a like a, a self aware idealized version of Cantor. You know what I mean? That actually like <laughs> uses his gifts to play defense. Um, like he's he's not chasing the stats, but he can absolutely do pretty much everything the Cantor does. Um, yeah, but he doesn't need to chase it. Yeah, exactly. Because the stats just come to him because yeah. he just he plays his role and he does his thing. Um, he was going to be my good one as well, but I have a I have a backup. All but, right, all right. I well, mean, was she good? On on top of what on top of what Macri said about him being the only guy with a positive net rating, if you look up. Um, like the the player groups with the and if you look up the top three man lineups, I used um what was the minimum amount of minutes? I think it was like, like thirty minutes. I used my cutoff. I figured you know just to make sure it's not like a little blip on the radar. Uh, he appears in six out of ten top lineups and net rating this year for the team as well, and that's usually a good indicator of like how good a player is. Like net rating by itself, you can take it or leave it. You know sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. So when you start using those lineup statistics and looking at, at like these three man groups, do this, uh, it it shows through for him. Like he he looks really good in that respect. Um, and then also, you know, just again, he he just does everything, man. I, I love Vonley so far. He's he's easily been my top my top thing to come out of the season so far. And what's lastly, what's good about him too is that unlike Moutier or Burke, like if Moutier or Burke play really really well. Uh, they might get paid because those are high money positions, the the point guard position. Vonley, I mean, if you look at like Kyle O'Quinn from last year, I mean, Vonley plays kind of similar to how O'Quinn did. You can almost argue better. Yeah. But O'Quinn signed for basically nothing, you know? So like even if the Knicks are put in a position where they have to retain Vonley, they could probably get away with signing him for like 4 $5 million a year and he'll be like a great contributor for them. So I, I think it's awesome. I mean, I th- he's probably the best the best player that we have on a, on like a one year deal, kind of doing that one year tryout thing, that I would think we have the most realistic chance of retaining, which is good. Awesome. Yeah, I, I agree, man. I, I look at Vonley as a cheap alternative to letting Cannon walk um, in the off season. Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, hopefully, you know, you can you can get him on a, on a cheaper deal. You, you never know; the market may be high for him, but at least as a uh, a plan B option to bring back, I, I would definitely consider Vonley for the future, man. Definitely, definitely. Mm-hmm. Was that your good, Al? The the um the net rating, or you had another good? Just Vonley in general was going to be my good, but okay. I'll say hey, I, I got a backup good. All right. I, I came prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got Google on my computer. All right, so there I, we I go. There we um, go. 
So uh, uh, I'm going to go with Moutier as my backup good. Okay. Um, after Vonley. Because Moutier, I mean, you know, we've talked about this before. Before the season, you thought he wasn't even going to be in the league halfway through the year. You know, people were like, just after preseason, it was like, cut oh, him. we got to make cut a him. roster spot. Cut Moutier. Get yeah. him the hell out of here. Like, we don't want Moutier. Absolutely. <laughs> Fizdale, Fizdale stayed true to his word. He, he got him right. I mean, he's, he's now uh, – He's averaging 10 points a game. He's shooting a career high 46% from the floor, which is six points higher than any percentage he's ever shot in his career. Um, he's moving the ball well. He plays within the team concepts. He's been playing passing lanes great. Um, he's averaging about a steal a game. But I I don't know, just these last, what, seven, eight games, maybe more. I mean, he's cooled a little bit from his peak of when, of like the dunk night. But yeah. uh, other than that, like, it, he's been playing good lately. And it's, you know, I think he's, if you're looking for testaments to how Fizz has been so far, uh, you could look at Vonley and you could look at Moody as the two guys that are kind of, uh, like, proof positive this guy can maybe develop these and, and turn young players into, into, you know, at least serviceable role players. So, I, I, Moody definitely is my backup good yeah, part uh, of the first part. <laughs> no, no question, man. You look at the development of, of Vonley and Moody, and now, now fans want Mario Hazoni to turn into the next Draz and Petrovic, man. I don't know, man. They're, they're waiting on him, man. I don't, we, we might, we might, we might be waiting all year for that one, man. I don't. I was know, about man. to say, don't, don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, don't hold your breath on that one. But uh, shout out to Super Mario. All right, let, let's go to the bed, uh, Macri. I'll, I'll start off with you. Um, what have you seen so far that? Um, I guess you, you you're not particularly liking in in this uh, short short season so far. Goodness. Um, okay, so let me. There's a lot of stuff, maybe that is not great, but a lot of that has to do with the talent. You know yeah. where the team is in their in their progress of trying to trying to build this thing up. Um, so let me go with something that is is a bad that could potentially linger and it's, it's kind of a specific one, but I, I think it's important nonetheless. Um, one of the, so obviously before the season, everybody was curious to see um, how is um, Fisdale going to get these guys to defend. And I was particular, like I didn't have any expectation that Inez Cantor was going to come in and all of a sudden become, you know, a great defensive player because he has certain physical limitations that are, there's just no getting around. The guy that I really wanted to see how he was going to come in and defend is Tim Hardaway Jr. Um, because physically, there is no reason why he should not be able to be a league average defender, if not better. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by, by, repeating what Alex said a minute ago, which is that individual ratings can be skewed. It could, you know, there's, there can be noise in numbers, even for a whole season, let alone 20, 23 games. That being said, um, Tim Hardaway Jr.'s defensive rating on the season is 114.5. That is bad. Um, I'm pretty sure that would be worse than the league if it was a, a team that was doing that. Um, that's worrisome to me. I, I listen. I know he's played a lot of his minutes with, with Cantor, and and that's not a great combination. He's played, you know, some of his minutes with obviously other other poor defenders. But I just I haven't loved what I have seen from him on that end, and it worries me long term because I think I'm. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not the organization sees him as a long-term piece, and if the right deal came along, would they take it, or would they hold out for more, thinking that he's more valuable than he actually is? So that's why, of all of the stuff that I've seen, and I know we could talk about Frank and Knox and a whole lot of other bad, bad stuff, I'm not as worried about that stuff. Tim is something that that's like kind of a, a stick in, in or whatever it is, it's a thorn in my side, something in my craw. I don't know what goes in your craw. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. So that's 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 my bad on the year. T- Terry, uh, where are you at on, on the bad side? Oh, we, we lost Terry's audio. Terry, you still? Uh... Hang on. Oh, I heard something. We heard something, Terry. We heard, we heard, we heard a crackle. 
What, what about now? Oh, perfect, perfect. I'm back good. in, man. I don't you're know what you're speechless, man. Speechless. <laughs> speechless and Tim Hardaway's defense, man. <laughs> I got it. So, um, for me, it's the offensive system. Not because, like, you know, there's a 25-game mark, so I'm not going to harp on it too much. But my worry is more long-term. Um, just to talk about Tim, for example, my biggest worry about Tim is not necessarily that he's not living up to the contract, because I think if you look at who's making money in this league, he kind of is. I thought, uh, was it 19 million point? But my worry is, is Tim Hardaway going to be effective as a third option when he's taking way less shots? Because there are different players who players who can shine as a first option. Um, you put them in a third option, it's a different story when there are better players taking all those shots. Interesting. Um, so to go to the offensive system in general, however, um, there's a lot of this my turn, your turn, um, yeah. ISO play. And Fitzgerald seems to kind of like it. Um, I think when he talks about aggression and he talks about activity, a lot of time it seems to just revolve around, you know, being with the, having the ball in your hand, making things happen. Um, we have one player coming back that's going to change this whole thing. And that's right. I am now, I, look, Fizzle can't, you know, KP has to be back before we see what Fizzle does with KP. But I'm worried about some of the tendencies some of these guys may get into um, and how how difficult or easy it depends will it be to adjust once this behemoth of a player comes back because our entire franchise is really built around Christoph Porzingis being the superstar obviously pending whatever happens next year um and even in this kind of system you see I think someone like Frank and someone like Knox really suffers from it um you see Frank all in the corner a lot I, I just don't see him thriving in a ISO only system um, and it's early, so I want to. I'm hoping that even even if it's not 25 games, even after, like Alex you said, after you know five, 10 games after 25, we really start seeing some more structure. Um, but this offense system of your turn, my turn, it's benefited some players. We brought up Bond there earlier. I think he's really benefiting from being able to show more of his skill set. I think he mentioned that at teams before they made him just rebound, uh, whereas here he's bringing the ball up, he's hitting threes. Uh, but on the flip side, I'm watching. Sometimes you have that Trey Burke. And um, I saw Zoe backward, and I'm like, no one's involved. There's a lot of dribbling around. There's a lot of looking for your own shot. And that doesn't really speak to the kind of, you know, the passing, the team atmosphere fizzle has been talking about. But I'm holding out hope that it's, like we said, it's an early season thing. And as soon as we settle into a real rotation in the system, he'll start holding guys more accountable um for you know maybe not playing defense and just focusing on getting your own shots um i'd like to see him bench tim hardaway jr at some point not i'm not meaning like he doesn't have to start or anything but mm. pull him out of the game if you feel as if the system's not running because to me that's what that's a long-term stuff i want to see because right now this is all tryout stuff um i want to mm. see the good habits being built because when kp comes back things are just going to change you know it's, then it's how these guys fit in with kp not just how well they're playing yeah. individually a whole whole another adjustment. Um, Al, yeah. where, where are you at on that, and, and what's what's your bad for this for the quarter season so far? Yeah, so just to touch on on the point that Terry was just making, like to um, the the whole thing with Frank being on the on the bench like that and coming in primarily with with Zoe Trier and Trey Burke is that yeah, it's he's not the type of player that's gonna like just take the ball at and pound you know pound the ball in the sand and you know figure out what to do with it you know what I mean like he he needs some sort of structure and I think that playing with those two I mean Trier is definitely great and right like I freaking love Trier and he is nice. probably the most talented it, it's crazy to say because he's an undrafted rookie but he's yep. maybe the most talented pure scorer on the team right now yep. um, yeah as definitely. far as like if you just if you just need someone who can create for themselves and get a bucket he's your guy uh, Burke is a little more frustrating like that. Um, and that Burke sometimes gets that tunnel vision, but he's not necessarily good enough to pull it off. You know, yeah. uh, it's yeah, like, right. it's like he's trying to dress too fashionable, but he just can't pull it. You know, like it's one of those, like, you're trying to look, you're trying to look like a superstar. Maybe you just can't pull it off. Um, he needs to stick to sweatpants sometimes. Um, but, uh, but he just, you know, Playing with those two, it's it's definitely I think detrimental for Frank. Like I think Frank was pe playing better in that first unit when he was in a position where he could be like even a secondary distributor. Although he did great as a primary distributor too, uh, by a lot of accounts. Um, but it's you know I think he 
he could benefit maybe from being back in the starting lineup again. So that's, that kind of leads into my next thing here, which is my, my bad is that I think that the whole keep what you kill thing has been a little bit of a fallacy so far. Mm. Like, I don't know if Fisdale is necessarily stuck to that in the way that he said he was going to at the beginning of the season, which again, he's, he's out. I, I, this is like a weird bad because it's bad, but I don't necessarily know if it's going to stick this right. way. Right. Yep. Um, yep. I got you. Because yeah. Fisdale has said that he's experimenting. But that said, I mean, like, there's kind of no excuse for like Mario Hazonia starting four or five games in a row and playing like crap and Damien Dotson sitting for four straight games uh, and you know, just rotting on the bench when this dude clearly can contribute. Yeah. Like there's like weird, it's like when you're watching a TV show and there's lots of plot holes, like there's a lot of plot holes season so far, you know, it like Fisdale preaches, Oh, defense first. And then sits one of his best defenders for four straight games. Right. And it's like, he preaches, keep what you kill. And then continue starting a guy who's not, who's not really producing. Um, and same with the defense first thing, like Frank, will play great defense when he's out there, but if he's struggling on offense, you know, he takes a couple shots and, you know, bricks him off front rim or whatever. And then he's the first guy with the hook. So it's, there's just a lot of disconnects like between what Fisdale says and what he does sometimes. And I hope again, you know, we're reaching this critical 25 game juncture that he set for himself. And so I hope that all this kind of smooths out then so I can stop worrying. But for now, I, the, the disconnect between what Fisdale says and what he does sometimes concerns me a little bit. Yeah, no, no, that that's certainly real, and and, and part of the learning process for you know not just the players is Fisdale's going to learn uh, to control what he says, you know, especially in this mm-hmm. media market, man. Because oh, yeah. e- everything you mm-hmm. say will be held against you at some point, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So, you know, I I definitely uh, echo those sentiments on on the you know inconsistencies with the with the keep what you kill. Um, all right, mm-hmm. let, let's go into um, the ugly. Uh, Terry, I'll go back to you, man. This might be a tough one, man, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it hurts as the biggest frag fan around, but let's well, get uh, into it. Let's yeah, get it, into it. It it's been ugly as of late. I think we forget how you know how he played in preseason. Remember, he won the spotting small forward rule. <laughs> yeah. Kind of off his preseason play. And I actually watched his highlights again against Brooklyn on a like 16 6 4 game or whatever. And a different player goes to Alex's point of the lineups he's put with. Now, Frank's really in his head right now. It is, I, you, you can't help but feel for the kid because you can see that he just wants to do the right thing out mm-hmm. there. His shot has just not falling. It has fallen off a cliff. You know, he was at 41%, I think, after six games. And yeah. actually did the stats on the last couple of games of the season, summer league, and the, the preseason and the beginning of the season. He was for at least, you know, not a lot of games, maybe 15, 16 games. But over that period, he was shooting like 38% from deep. So to me, this current, like, you know, last couple of games, he's almost at like 13, 14, 15%. Definitely an aberration. But you would have hoped to see him kind of be able to get out of that funk. Because last year, I know after a kind of decent start, he went into a funk for about two months during those winter months. And this is reminding me of that. And I, I don't know what it's going to take to pull him out of it. And I almost feel like sometimes that hole is getting dug deeper. Um, and Frank seems to me like someone who almost needs, he needs like that push the way Moutier, I think needed a coach to tell him, Hey man, you don't look over your shoulder. Don't look at me, run the plays, do it. Frank needs, I think Frank is someone who needs that kind of love, but it's kind of hard for a franchise to just completely commit to giving one guy that love, you know, you you get the fan base argues all the time. Like it's Frank, the most important thing ever. Why are we always coddling Frank? Yeah. But I almost think for me, if you draft a project guy, Right. And, you know, he's this team first guy who wants to play defense and literally just wants to do whatever the coaches said. Uh, There's a New York Times interview um, or a story about Frank from um, like the January 2017 before he was drafted. Um, And the coach literally said, you know, Frank sometimes listens to me to a fault. And you can see those same things kind of playing out now. So I think with Frank, uh, it's so hard. There's just been so much discussion and so much so noise much, about him. So mean, much. Trade rumors. Yeah. Um, I just want him to be able to develop in peace. Uh, I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know if that means, you know, him just kind of starting and no more discussion about his playing time and just letting him play. I don't know if it means him being on the bench, but running the second unit. There's just so much to unpack about Frank. I'm interested to hear you guys' thoughts. Yeah. Uh, but it's been ugly so far, especially from a shooting standpoint. But I will say... 
had his shock been falling, almost none of the discussion would be happening. It yep. literally, yeah. if you look at his play, even a couple of games ago, I think against Memphis in 13 minutes, he had like 7.6 boards, uh, one assist. Um, it's these two, these donut games he's had, the last two have been obviously horrible. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the, the initial fall off for just his shooting. Um, his play was still decent. He's still playing defense. He's still getting at it. But the shooting's been disappointing because you look at the form and it's good. And, you know, it goes into that shoulder thing we've kind of heard rumors about. And Frank is, he's such a, he's not a knockdown shooter. So guys like that, one little ailment or even, you know, a bit of pain would, could take your shot way off. So I want to see if that's something, but uh, Frank, it's, I, I, you see so many thoughts. I can't even so, get through them. So, <laughs> so much to unpack. And, and yeah. Macri, this is, this is a perfect um, segue to you because uh, yeah. you, wrote a, you wrote a great article <laughs> on nicksfilmschool.com on, on the mystery of Frank. Um, clearly the, the most polarizing player on this team when it comes to this fan base, you know, you he have is. the, uh, you have the Donovan Mitchell, the, the Jason Tatum that I feel like they're forever going to be attached to this kid, their success, uh, Dennis Smith Jr. Forever going to be attached to this kid. Um, and, and as far as why we didn't take him, you know, is he the point? Is he the three? Is he better off the bench? Is he better as a starter? Uh, what happened to his jumper? Will he ever be, you know, a consistent, um, you know, that attacking point guard that everybody likes? Um, well, a lot to unpack, but, but you know, what, what's your take on this so far? Well, the first thing I want to do is just, you know, Terry said something really, really interesting. And I think it's it. We spend so much time talking about him. And I think there's a segment of the fan base that gets almost like it, they get really annoyed that the conversation centers around Frank so much. But to me, it's like if if he was just their draft pick and the, you know, the eighth pick last year and he just, you know, had been have been bad um, or he's shown signs in different areas but nothing really to grab onto is to get excited about. I don't think there would be this conversation. Right. I think it would be, you know, the Knicks messed up. Um, a guy who, you know, the guy was drafted to play in a system. The system isn't here anymore. He's, you know, not useless, but he's not going to have the value that we thought. The, his defense is like, you know, if you have a, a, a shithole of a house, excuse my French, but you know that there's a diamond in the house, you're going to take the time to sort through. It's like a hoarder left the house and there's a diamond somewhere in there. You, we know the diamond is in there. It's there. We've seen it. And the reason why I get, I guess, so passionate about him is I, everybody sees the way the league is going and they're like, you got to score. You got to score. You got to score. Well, guess what? Everybody could score. Everybody's going to be able to score pretty soon. The rules are dictating that teams are going to be able to put the ball in the basket more easily going forward. That is not going to change. It's, it's going to be a trend that continues that way yeah. to have a guy who can shut down the, the position on the floor that generates all that offense. That is going to become the new most valuable commodity in this league. As long as you could keep that guy on the floor on the other end. And he's not a black hole on offense. He's not Tony Allen. He's not, you know, uh, Roberson. Yeah, exactly. Roberson. Yeah. I feel bad. Classic shout out to Roberson. Yeah, shout out. Yeah, get well soon. I feel soon, bad for that dude. Uh, get well soon, yeah, for sure. Anyway, we have that. We know we have it. And the ugly for me has just been this week because if you had if you had told me before the season that this team would be going out and playing hard pretty much every night. I mean, they've gotten killed a few nights, but I don't think anybody can question their effort this year. Um, and, you know, and you would have told me that we would have gotten these surprising performances from these young players out of nowhere. Um, and you would have told me that like this team has bought into this coach to the point that like they dumped whatever water on him after the, the <laughs> Memphis game, yeah. you know, Everything has lined up for this year to be exactly everything you could have hoped for. And yet this week, these, especially these last few days, it's gotten ugly. And I'm trying to figure out why that is. And it's like, it all comes, I mean, it's sad, but it all comes back to Frank. It all comes back to Frank, man. It all comes back to Frank. And, and 
And what has the kid done? I mean, yeah. he's playing 25 minutes, 20, whatever, 24 point, whatever minutes a game as a 20 year old that he, they're, li- you know, they're trying to re hardwire his most core instincts about how to play this game and turn him into someone that is, that needs to be more, that is more aggressive. And I, I, you know, trust me, there is a part of me, it eats at me. Like it eats at my core as a Nick fan where I'm just like, maybe we just let the kid be what he is. But at the same time, if you have a coach in David Fisdale, who's been around for two decades in this league and has coached with Golden State and Miami and Atlanta, he's been all around the league. He was on every like hot coach list when before he got his first head gig. He's like, this is the next great coach. Are we supposed to believe that he doesn't know his ass from his elbow when it turn, when it comes to what to do with this kid with this ultra, you know, special ability? You know, I, I was talking to, to Alex yesterday in, in, in DMs and in Twitter. Like, I'm probably too deferential to leadership in this league and guys that are supposed to know what they're doing. But I just, you know, I, I, I guess the ugly for me is how we've responded as a fan base to yeah. what's going on. And I, I just, I hope we can give this thing a little bit more time. It's 23 games into Absolutely. the season. Absolutely. So Al- that's where I'm at. Absolutely, mm-hmm. man. And, and Al, me, me and you did that post game after the Memphis game on, on Sunday, just mm-hmm. a little under a week ago. Bro, we had over 500 people in the chat. People mm-hmm. are going crazy. Fizdale is the man. Moutier, you know, Moutier is the MVP. It, you know, I mean, we had people talk, talking the P word. It went from the tank to playoffs in a week. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Then, then, then we have the Detroit uh, game. Now we have the Philly game. And it's just darts coming from left and right trade rumors coming from minnesota from phoenix from yeah. milwaukee now wants frank yeah. i mean I do, I do people just do not and and not to, to take from from joel and b but people are just not trusting the process man so i, I, I don't know man <laughs> what, what's your take on this out i just uh, it's funny i sent a tweet on this yesterday where i was like the knicks are never allowed to take more than two days yeah. off between games again. <laughs> mass because hysteria man it, it's it's like we're left alone with our thoughts mm-hmm. and, and turning into freaking <laughs> monsters, you know. The it, echo chamber, man. The echo chamber. It, oh man, it, you know you can't you can't leave Knicks fans and Knicks media alone in their thoughts for more than a day or two, or you know, all of a sudden, especially after a tough loss like that one in Philly, you know, because then it's just the sky starts falling, man. You know, everybody's everybody's convinced that you know this team is garbage and. Every player is garbage. You got a hit piece coming out on Knox and Frank that's like they're soft. They don't yeah. look good. Blah, blah, blah. And it's ridiculous, man. That was before Macri said. So my my top two options for bad have been taken so far. <laughs> <laughs> because first I was gonna say Frank slump. Then I was gonna say uh, people overreacting and having weird um, expectations for the season. Like, what are you expecting? out of this season that everybody wants to tank, but then you lose a couple bad games and everybody says, Oh my God, like the whole team sucks. Blah, 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 yeah. whatever. Like, <laughs> it's like, you want the team to suck. Most of you want a high draft pick. Right. You want this. Like yeah. this is what you asked for. Um, so I don't know. What am I going to pivot to for my ugly now? Um, you know, I'll just there's, keep there's building off it. Practice. Yeah. You can just keep yeah, building, just keep I mean, building off the topic. Just embrace, I'll just keep em- building off it, man. Embrace, yeah. embrace you know the what? prank. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Like the amount of people that you know, I'll say, I'll, I'll say this for my ugly, and it's totally repairable. Like my other ugly would be that Knox hasn't quite looked like the like rookie of the year stud that we thought he was going to look like after summer league. But then my my like bringing it back with that is that I don't, I don't, that's an ugly. That's not a bad. You know what I mean? It's just like Frank slump. Like Knox's struggles have just been ugly so far, but as you're young and the reality is, is that for a while they're going to suck because like, they don't know how to play in the NBA. Like they, I don't know why people expect, you know, people like Donovan Mitchell that come in and like run the league from day one. Those are like one set really, right. yeah. Like yeah. six years. You know what I mean? Like there's been a couple, like last year there were two of them. There was Ben Simmons and, Donovan Mitchell, both in the same year, and I, and Jason Tatum to a degree, but he's right. even he's fallen back in the bad habits yeah. this year and stuff that people were worried about before he got drafted. 
but I mean, people now just, you know, after a year like that, everybody's like, Oh my God, well, look at how good these guys were in their first, second year or whatever. Like, why isn't Frank there yet? And it's like, well, I don't know. Maybe he's just not that type of player. Like maybe he takes a little more seasoning. The kid's still growing. The kid's like, like Frank grew like two inches this summer, which means his arms grew a little bit, which means his legs grew, which means that his whole concept of even how yeah. to dribble a basketball changed over the summer, you know? And, and the same thing happened to, you know, countless other players leading, you know, before this, like Giannis, uh, Gian, I hate to keep coming back to him because that's, yeah. that's a really unfair comparison to draw, but yeah. You know, I, I think that it, my there's my point is there's plenty of ugly things so far this year, but nobody should be reactive if any of the ugly things are necessarily permanent yet. Yeah. It, it, you know, that's the biggest thing is that we expected that this season was going to be ugly, but, you know, we should just accept it and roll with it and maybe even have some fun with it. <laughs> you yeah, know what I yeah. mean? Just that's en- how I enjoy it. <laughs> Enjoy these moments of ugliness now so that you can take in the beauty later. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, these will be fun to look back at, hopefully, in two, three years if these guys develop the way we want them to. And you look back and say, well, I remember when everybody was shitting on Frank because they thought he was awful in his second year, you know, 20 games in, which will sound absurd, hopefully, in yep. a couple of years it when will. he's a good player. <laughs> I, I think you bring up, a, both of you guys brought up a great point, but that we're living on die, at living and dying on every game. Yeah, yeah, it's not we good. We are a contender. Like, you see the Celtics fans right now are freaking out at their season so far. Every game is like, my God, what's going on? We figured it out. Try being a Rockets fan right now. Oh, oh man, Rockets. yeah. <laughs> Rockets fans are off the ledge right now, man. It's all, and it's all Melo's fault. It's all Melo's fault. <laughs> it's, all, right? well, it's still Melo's fault. Jeez. But, yeah, so we, we, all, we have to take a step back and just look at the long view. This season yes. is supposed to be bad. Frank is going to be – Frank is – in three years, Frank is going to be 23 years old. That's three years from today. You know, you brought up Ben Simmons and Donovan Mitchell, right? Those guys, Ben Simmons missed his first season, came in at 21, or um, he's 22 now. Um, Donovan was 22, I think, when he started. Uh, Kevin Knox is 19. Like, I think our fan base is so just not used to actually developing players. I posted something yesterday on Twitter. I think we must have traded away the most drafted rookies yes. of any in the last 20 yes. years. I cannot, oh, there's yeah. no way we have it. From Wilson Chandler, Gallinari, Ariza, Channing Fry, the yeah. list goes on. Jordan Hill after three months, <laughs> the list yeah. goes on. So we we have to just this. I think development is Fisdale's developing as a coach, and we need to develop as fans. We need to realize that this is what rebuilding is. I like Accept it. it. Like live. Like understand it's supposed to suck a little bit. Yeah, it's not just gonna be roses and butterflies the whole way through. Um, so just kind of relax. Take a step back. Let these kids be kids. Let them play. We're not trying to win this season anyway. So to me, any rash trade rumors or anything like that right now, especially for these young guys, is really short-sighted. Especially for a guy like Frank, just to go back to him quickly. Frank, to me, looks like a role-player veteran on a winning team. And I think he shines when he when you're on a winning team. He, he, the right. stuff he does right now, without him even developing, the stuff he does right now will shine so much more when yes. there's four better scoring options, when KP's back, when those little things he does on defense uh, are creating more opportunities. So to judge him on a team like this, which to me is exactly opposite of his play style, of his natural tendencies, um, and he, he needs to learn to break out of that too. It's not saying that, oh, you could, yep. let's wait till KP, he's going to be great then. Uh, but it's it's a process. It's Frank learning to be a more kind of liberal player when, in a system where it's more open for everyone. And then... On the flip side, us as a fan base and Fizz and everyone just calming down and saying, guys, this development. if things work right, we're going to be good, at least good playoff good for the next five, six, seven, eight years, if not more than that. So let's, let's enjoy, like, enjoy this. Let's trust the process. Enjoy this time when it's up and down and just enjoy what you're seeing on the court instead of going so crazy mass hysteria after every single game. Up or down, whichever way it is, you know. Yeah. Kobe said it. You got to keep even keel in this league. The fans too. <laughs> well said. Well, well said. Well said, man. I just got to say that uh, we should make T-shirts that say Knicks fans need to develop as fans. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's we do. A mantra, man. We do. Like a mantra. <laughs> you know, quick thing. Quick thing. I did want to say though. I saw those shooting is insane to me. They yes, shoot it is. Forty-five yeah, from ISO, three. Man. Like, he's shooting, like, Dotson to me is a knockdown shooter, and I think he's shooting, like, 10% better than Dotson, and a lot of this is off the dribble, 
and he's shooting what with uh, 39 from the field. I am like I've all I've kind of pegged him probably wrongly as a six man guy, and I'm now kind of like if he got Tim Hardaway's shots this season, I have, I don't know if he would be if he would be more efficient. I'm almost like I feel like he might be. Um, I saw those an interesting one to watch because these stats it's still early, but this is elite you know, star efficiency here, 40, 45 from three, 49. Obviously, it is. Scott will report more, Scott, Scott will report more in the future and stuff like that. But his shooting percentage, more so than just a general play, his shooting percentages are a really impressive. I think, I think to your point on if he would have the same efficiency as Tim, if he was in the same role, I don't think he would. I, yeah. I think based off what we've seen from him, he'd probably be about similar. It, but that's just my opinion. Because the thing with Tim lately is, I mean, Tim was shooting those percentages to start the year. He was shooting crazy good. Um, but then teams started keying to him, like starters. You know, once you start getting the starters on the opposing team are game planning just for Tim Hardaway, like he's not that dude. Like he can't, he can't handle that. So, I, and I, I think you like Trier mostly plays against bench guys, um, which I think allows him to shine a little more. Uh, honestly, though, there's no discounting his season. He's been freaking amazing. Like awesome. the fact that I mean, realistically, like rookie of the year candidate right now. I mean, he would probably finish top five in rookie of the year voting, and it, he's a dude that didn't even get drafted. It's insane. Like, all rookie, all rookie so definitely possible. It's it's in the car. It's possible. Oh yeah, yeah. He's definitely if he continues on the current path, he's for sure making an all rookie first. Like, team, yeah. At, yeah. Oh yeah. At the very least second team you know what i mean yeah. he'll probably make first team if he keeps going like this yeah I, I got a quick prediction on him he's gonna go to the rookie game this year and win mvp uh, he's gonna go to that rookie oh, game i, I wouldn't be surprised he's gonna be man. so focused he's gonna play that game like it's game seven of the finals <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i can see that to, yeah he's gonna look to show up don shake jaron jackson all Hell these yeah. guys uh, he uh, does have a schoolyard game that's like tailor-made for an all-star game oh definitely environment. Definitely. <laughs> definitely definitely man but yeah, shout, shout out to ISO, man. All right, so um, we'll, we'll get to the final thoughts. Al, I'll, I'll uh, segue over to you. I feel like I never even used the whole thing. So, <laughs> it's all um, good, man. All good. So um, Alex Wolf on Twitter at the Alex Wolf. That's A L E X W O L F E. Uh, I write for Posting and Toasting, SB Nation's Knicks blog. Uh, I also run the at PT's blog Twitter account. That's where you find most of my Knicks takes these days and Knicks memes and things of that nature. Cause you know, I like the attention there more than my own account. So <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I appreciate that's you. Appreciate it, man. All right, Macri, we'll go to you. You can find me at uh, JC Macri NBA uh, on Twitter. Um, I just want to shout out uh, today on uh, Knicks film school. Um, that's obviously where I write for we just launched our Patreon, um, but unlike Patreons for a lot of other sites, um, 100% of the money that we are collecting is going towards a different charity every month. Nice. Um, we're asking anybody who joins, joins the site to or goes on the site to donate $1 each month. Um, it will go for a good cause, and that is my 30 seconds. Great. Excellent, excellent, man. Yeah, man, the uh, the charitable uh, initiatives that you guys do are great. Uh, I'm always happy to uh, to participate in it, so keep up the good work with that. All right, Terry, closing the show, the real Terrence Ross. <laughs> the real one. The real All one. Right. <laughs> All right. So we're on YouTube. We have season tickets. We're going to London, uh, NYK, Terry and Trey. You know, we do the vlogs from the games. We sometimes meet players. It's pretty fun. But overall, I want to give a shout-out to all of Knicks fan media. You guys make me so much smarter. Uh, Alex, I've read your stuff and posting and toasting. Mac, I listen to podcasts all the time. I But there's so many more. Nick Swall, there's so many of you guys who do so much great work. And I think it makes that's why our fan base is awesome. We got to learn to develop. But our fan base, <laughs> awesome. The discussion on Twitter. We should, be, we should be proud to have such a really cool fan culture. And once the team starts winning, which they will, it's going to be good. I promise, guys. Good. Indeed, indeed, and I echo awesome. those sentiments, man. The uh, the the Knicks fan based media community is uh, top notch. I, I don't see anything even close to it in, in as far as NBA Twitter, or NBA um, based media is concerned. So uh, right. keep up, keep up the good work, my guy Terrence Ross. Appreciate you, Jonathan Macri. Appreciate you, Alex Wolf. Definitely appreciate it. That has been the quarter season report. Leave a comment in the comment section below. Let us know uh, what your good, bad, and ugly was. Also, let us know uh, whose point stuck out the most to you. And uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit that thumbs up. 
and share this video with your fellow Knicks fans. So uh, until next time, I'll catch up with you guys. Peace. I, I will say this. When we're, we're throwing it back, and i got to give it up to Kevin Knox. He showed some New York blood tonight. He, he showed, showed some cojones. Let's go, Knox. That's what I want to see, man. That's how you respond wow. to the criticism. Wow. Definitely. Yeah. Gritty on both ends Gritty. of the ball. I mean, every play, he was 